How many of you have heard the idea, uh, the word zombie ideas before? Okay, some of you. So what is a zombie idea? So a zombie idea is an idea that doesn't work, but never dies. <laughs> Does that surprise anyone? Well, I heard this terminology, uh, you know, maybe a couple of months ago, and uh, I got fascinated by it. And I said, what are, what are people talking about? And of course, it started with an article in New York Times by Paul Krugman, and he defined that in terms of uh, financial situation. Well, we educators were not going to be left behind. We said we were going to do our own educational zombie ideas. Okay. So what are these? In general, these are ideas. Uh, uh, you know, the, the biggest one is online learning and technology. So, so I said, okay. I was going to come up with my own uh, you know, thoughts around this zombie idea topic. And I said, you know what? I'm going to talk about how open access is transforming education. And guess what? It's helping kill, kill zombies. Now, that's the premise I'm going to talk about in my talk. And, and I will talk to you about three main zombie ideas that we've identified at CK12. Before we do that, I'd like to just briefly take you through the journey of, you know, this is going to be so brief, but it's, it's, it's sampling of the timeline of the learning machine in education, machines in education. So you will identify with some of them starting in uh, 1870, then going on to the blackboard, you know, something? This was the most successful technology ever invented in education. And guess what? We still use it. Accelerator, reading accelerator. Skinner, B.F. Skinner. How many of you heard of B.F. Skinner here? Quite a few, so you know what that means. I actually met somebody whose parents bought him a, a, a teaching machine. And so it's, it's not a tale, it's actually a real occurrence. And uh, you know, B.F. Skinner thought that he could change everything in education by just well, providing a, a, a box, a wooden box. Where, where people could have a question and answer it and go on to the next one. Right idea, not quite ready to. Then, of course, the computer, the interactive whiteboard, the laptops, and now the tablets. Are these zombies in education? One of the premises of education that we never really have embraced is the idea that we are all individuals. And I think that adds to what happens to zombiness. A lot of these ideas, a lot of these uh, um, tools that come along are never really used in ways that's, that they are supposed to be used. So as far as you know, my philosophy is that we have to have students in the center with mentors, teachers, whoever those people are that helping them, helping the students learn as one important facet of making learning happen for uh, students. There are two other components that are very important. One of them is information and the other one is tools. If these three things don't come together for students, guess what folks, learning and teaching in a universal way is not going to happen. So first zombie idea that I'd like to talk about, and this is a big one. We've been hearing all, you know, forever and a day, fixed time and variable learning. So what do we do? We put children in grades and say at every grade, this is what you're going to learn. And we don't care what they learn in the end, but that's what happens. And we say this is the only efficient way to provide universal access. Now I'm talking about universal access, uh, universal education, excuse me. So what are the consequences of this? Ken Robinson, 
I'm sure you, most of you have heard of uh, Ken Robinson, if you're in edu education. He talks about it very eloquently. I, I um, actually, you know, you should go and check out his, his RSA uh, talk if you haven't done so. It's actually pretty informative. And it talks about how we create students in a box and kind of say 2010, here's the uh, class of 2010 in a box and this is what they've learned. We've created students in a box. And what we've done is in the process lost those students. We've actually created low expectation of those students because we are teaching to the middle whatever we can do. Maybe at times we're not even teaching to the middle, we're actually even teaching to the lowers or the highest. So it depends on what you're teaching that um, you know, gets us in this problem. So <clears throat> the new model from CK12 is that we can focus on students. We can focus on their individual learning. And how do we do that? I love dogs, so hence my moment. Okay. Oops, sorry. I want to turn it off. Let me ask. Okay. So think about individuals. One of them just got up looked around, started walking, started doing what we're all supposed to do. There are basic differences that we are born with. There are differences. This, the second puppy hasn't quite made up its mind that it's going to start moving. Folks, that's real. It's not imagined. There are these individual differences that we have to deal with in education as educators, as parents, and the rest of us. This is serious. So what have we done in CK12? Okay. So when we started, we said, what was it that we were going to do? We said, let's provide everything a student would need to have access. Now, I'm not going to show you how this worked right here, but I would invite everyone to go and check our website to really see how this happens. So what we provided was for middle school and high school STEM subjects, all of them at different levels. We created textbooks which we termed flexbooks so that you could customize them, you can contextualize them to your own student population so that you were not stuck with uh, textbooks that you were given. Now, this is very important because we wanted to provide every bit of information. Remember the triangle? This is part of that triangle. The tools allowed you to do what you need to do. The content is there for you to use with the tools. I believe that we need to have a basic library of information that's free and open and accessible for you all or for the students to be able to, to learn. So once we did that, we did that for the teachers. We provided all the different teachers' resources that one would need uh, to make this successful. What did we do next? We said, OK, what is it that's causing students not to want to learn? Textbooks are boring. Now, I love textbooks. <laughs> so I'm not one of those, but I do believe they're boring for most students because they don't make sense to them. So let's make sense of this information for, to be digestible by each student. And so we said, OK, what is it that the students would like to do? We said, let's create concept-based learning for the students. If a small chunk of content that a student can you know, learn, read, or whatever they need to do with it, and we said, OK, we created knowledge pathways based on these concepts because we knew students needed the answers to, why should I learn this? And this is where we said, let's put it in context. Give them pathways to learn. So we created concept maps around this learning. Each one of these concepts is supported by not just text, 
but it's supported by videos. It's supported by different modalities, modalities being different ways to learn. So we gave them a text-like material. We gave them videos. We gave them real-world application. We can give them creative things, creative, um, uh, creative uh, ways to learn this. We can give them critical questions asking. We can create real-world examples. For the people that came in or, you know, at the beginning and saw that uh, the screen which says real-world uh, example, that's about that. We are trying to encourage students to think creatively about how these concepts apply in real life. This is how technology helps us get to where we have to get to with the students. I'm, I have to take a second to kind of, um, unfortunately it's not. Okay, I can't get to the website from here. But really what these are, I was gonna show you some of, we've created these manipulation, manipulatives or simulations that actually um, students can actually create, um, use to learn. Um, it's actually pretty neat, I wanna show you. It's not there. Yeah, so what, what it is, we provide actual interactions that students can do in the, in, on our website so that students can actually manipulate at the different parameters and see how things impact when they're in a system. So that becomes a really important part of learning. I think it doesn't work when it's on now. It's okay, don't worry about it. Well, we can show you that a little later if you are interested. Um, Technical problems. It's, what did you do? Okay, so I'm gonna skip this slide, but basically we can, we can provide different levels of learning and having students really manipulate all this uh, themselves and learn from, uh, and it's not just static stuff, but actually stuff that they can play around with and learn. So. What happened with all this is I got, last year I got a call from three high school students, 10th graders and 11th graders who said, we'd like to take the content that you guys created and build on top of that. Build on top of that a system that students can teach, uh, use for peer-to-peer -peer learning or peer-to-peer -peer tutoring. So what they did was if you needed to learn something, you could come to this website, it's called studel.org. 10th graders and 11th graders in high school creating this white, you know, uh, this technology to be able to do this. Their premise was, we can say to our uh, peers that if you do this, if you help other students out in say, um, uh, you know, by teaching, by holding a class, when you teach you actually put a time down that you're going to be there at and everyone comes in, whoever needs help, and at that, you actually get um, um, uh, community service hours, which is a requirement in most schools. So this becomes pretty important. It becomes very useful for students to start uh, you know, using technology in a very meaningful way. They actually created this whiteboard technology, uh, and it's free. Students are now creating uh, groups that are they're actually starting to teach other students. We also have learned that students need guidance because you know that's something. Have you, do you remember taking a test where you agonized over that one problem that you couldn't get? And, and what happened? You agonized, agonized, agonized. Finally, you take a risk and you put some answer down. And the teacher takes the test paper away. It may be week, two weeks, days, whatever the time period but that learning moment is gone. They need that, they need that instant feedback. Technology allows us to do that. 
we can give them guidance to the student. So if they, they're falling behind, we can, you know, we, we have quizzes that students can take so that if they're falling behind, we can figure out where they are that they need help in or where they're getting stuck. We can then say, this is where you're doing well, this is not where you're doing well. We can actually start guiding them. Once you start guiding them, you can actually start putting together a playlist for them so that they can get different things to learn from. And the good thing about this is that they don't have to wait for teachers. We can tell them some students love to read and then go watch videos. Other students like to watch a video and then maybe read. We can actually start telling them, hey, you know, every time you switched over and started watching a video, guess what happened? And then read, you actually did it much better than if you read and then watched a video. So we can start helping them think about the way they learn best. So it is important, and technology can help us do this. Teachers also can get into this game. You know, they can learn how students are doing. They can actually say, wow, Sally's made progress. She's making progress. Of course, you know, you can encourage Sally. Only bad part is you cannot give Sally a hug. Oh, but you can't give a hug in our system, school system anyways, right? <laughs> so these are real results. We actually have been doing, uh, using our system in, um, I, I, I know the speaker before me, who was a hard act to follow in many ways, um, actually is working with the LPS, which is uh, the, the green and the red bars. So if you look at the bars on my left, um, those are the starting points for four of these, charter, these schools. There are the three charter schools in Vision and Leadership Public Schools, two of their campuses, Hayward and Richmond. And then finally, we did some work with River, Riverside Unified School District. And you, I'll just take one example, which is LPS Hayward. LPS Hayward was named the second best charter school in California based on the work that they did on our Algebra I, uh, you know, the improvement they made in standardized testing. They were tested uh, on California standardized tests. So that's idea number one, right? Zambia idea number one. Number two, that the highest quality instructional resources need to be expensive. What does this do? What are the consequences? The consequences is one sixth of the world over age 15 can't read or write because they don't have access to material. $1.3 billion was spent out of pocket by teachers because they couldn't afford to get, you know, the, 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 their schools or the system didn't give them enough money to get content to their students. California was sued a few years back. I don't know how many of you know about the Williams Act. They were required by law to give all the students a textbook. Can you even imagine not having a textbook to learn from? It's pathetic in the US of A that we cannot give our children the information they need. I went to India and I talked to, of course I'm Indian, I went to India and I talked to the president at that point and I said, you know, um, I, I'd love to help. He looked at me and said, Nehru, you gotta be kidding me. Our content costs pennies. And I came right back to help you. So our model is open, global, and free access to up-to-date resources that can be customized across all devices. We are providing content so you can access it any way. You don't have a computer, fine. Teacher will have a computer, she can customize that content, okay? I just wanna, this is not a slide that's ours. I actually borrowed it from, some, uh, from another source and it's cited, but what they, uh, this is important is that they're saying that high quality free content is becoming increasingly available and CK12 is one of the providers. So there are many people who are doing great work around this, Khan Academies, I'm sure you're all heard of. Uh, Wikipedia is again, always a great resource. 
uh, and there are others. And all of us are trying to create content that is meaningful, quality, quality assured, so that people can have access. And it's all free for most of us. We are gaining support. California did um, uh, open free textbook initiative a few years back, and we were one of the largest suppliers of that initiative. One of our books was 80%, 86% aligned. We could actually go, because of technology within days, bring it up to 100% alignment. So it's easy to do. Utah did an experiment, a uh, pilot last year. They took um, our content reduced it to the Utah requirements, and they printed these books for each student, 300 pages for $4.60. There's no reason you should pay $100 to $150 a book when you can do it at a cheaper rate, or almost free, basically. And the results were actually comparable. If that was just the first time that they were using our content. This year the pilot's gone bigger and, the, and I think next year we'll have the whole of Utah using this content. Washington State was one of the first ones that kind of uh, Clark Gable in this picture is holding up a CK-12 book in, in the hearing to change this um, initiative, to start this initiative about free open um, content being good content, quality content. And this is now available. Uh, it's a law now. It's an initiative. They are, Washington is using our content. Um, so what? Does anyone care? I think they do. Since we brought in the concept-based learning, our traffic since July of school this year has gone up 11 million page views. 2.3 million visitors, and 30 million learning experiences. That means different things people have you know, uh, uh, accessed. Not only that, remember I said that we were available in most devices? True to commitment, we put our books on Amazon, 1.3 million downloads, 700,000 on uh, Apple's uh, iPads, and 35,000 in the Google Play, which is a newer, newer player in this whole field. Our biology, we put up one biology interactive book on the iBook authoring platform that Apple produced. Three months, it's been on the top 10 uh, textbook, free textbook list. It's been number one, it was number one for quite a few weeks. I don't know who, which is number one anymore. Um, I haven't checked yet, but um, people care. TFA, um, Teach for America teachers actually rated it 4.9 out of 5. Even before, this is the very early content that we created. This is a great story. The, the school district, Anoka Hennepin in Minnesota, was given by 200,000 by the board and said, create our own content. Guess what? They saved $175,000 of that $200,000 and created their own content. You know what they can do with that? They can buy devices. You know what else they can do with that? They can actually take that content and keep improving it every year because it's theirs. They can iterate, uh, you know, learn, uh, use it in the classroom, see what works, change it and improve it. Zombie idea number three. Now, I don't me necessarily mean to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of slam traditional publishers, but, about, you know, by that I'm just saying that, you know, it doesn't have to be that you pay, um, that some one person creates the best content for students. How does that play out? Innovation's very slow. You keep getting the same content for seven years, one size fits all, and you know how much that works. If I, if I am at this level, and you give me content that's really up high, 
there's no way I can actually, as a student, rise up to that content. I need scaffolding. I need to be individual. I need my own individual content so I can actually bring myself up to the level that I am supposed to be at. Now, that whole model is still wrong, but you know that's reality today. We've got to be able to bring our students to the point that we need them to be at. We know that many of these, con um, many of these books get printed and they stay there for seven or more years. I know that Texas did uh, adoption, um, one adoption cycle where they had over 100,000 mistakes in the textbooks. That made big news. We can fix those using technology. Pluto, Pluto is no longer a planet, but my son's textbook still says it's a planet. Yeah, go look at any, any of those textbooks. Customization, right? They're, none of them are customizable in the format that they're on. No, does it matter? Well, let's see. Um, one of the most important things is that I think you've me the, that you miss the feedback on, on the format that textbooks are in today. That technology just doesn't give you what you need to teach students. So with you know, technology tools that we are kind of uh, designing, we are able to do that. So our new model, teachers and students are creating content. And it's great content. And I've got news for you guys. For eons, teachers have been doing this. They've been creating their own versions in their classroom. But now we're trying to make their life easier by giving them tools that might help us, help them to be better uh, teachers. And so they don't have to scramble around, keep piles of folders on which they have to depend upon. So, oh, this is not going to play again, right? No. I wanted to show some student generated content. If you would just give me a. Sorry. Uh, can we take it out? Just play it. Uh, just play it regular mode. Yeah, just play regular mode. I think he put it on mirroring. Let's take mirroring off. This is important. You'll enjoy this. So give me a minute to fix this. Um, but it, can you take, take it off mirroring? Okay, that's good. It's going to play. This is great. Can you hear it? You can't hear it? Hurricanes are the most destructive natural disasters ever. They can rip apart houses and destroy large areas of land. Hurricanes basically feed off of warm air. They form over a warm body of water and the warm air rises up into clouds. This process works sort of like a straw. When you suck on a straw, you aren't just sucking the water up into your mouth. You are actually lowering the air pressure on top of the liquid, causing it to rise. Because the air rises, you are left with a low pressure area below the forming hurricane. The other air starts to come into the low pressure zone, and this process starts to happen so fast, the clouds and wind start spinning, and then you are left with a hurricane.
straw hurricane example. When you step on it, you lower the air pressure and the water comes up. A toilet is a good example of the swirling motion of a hurricane. When you flush the toilet, the water comes out of a little hole in the bottom of the toilet, swirls around, and carries whatever's in the toilet away. Let's check it out. <laughs> It works a bit like a hurricane in the sense that it carries whatever it touches away. The cake is alive. Um, I don't know whether you can guess what age group that was. Middle school. It's a middle school students that have access to tools and they can use them. They've been trained to use them. They've been you know, given uh, creativity to use them. Imagine these kids creating on a slate or a scroll. Where would we, we be today? Okay. So user-generated content actually becomes quite, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's great because everyone has a voice now. Show me is uh, you know, on, the, on one side, on the left hand side, you see uh, various other very successful groups that are doing user generated content for education. Show me is an iPad app on which you can create uh, sketches and share with people. Better Lessons has lesson plans for, uh, uh, excuse me, Show me has 500,000 K, um, uh, 500,000 user-generated pieces out of which 5,000 of them are aligned to uh, Common Core. So this shift is happening. Te um, better lessons have th hundreds of thousands of lessons that teachers can actually uh, pull from uh, and use in their classroom. As is teachers uh, pay teachers, I think there's a famous case where one of the teachers earned a million dollars from her work on um, teachers pay teachers. YouTube, of course, YouTube was, uh, was, you know, kind of trashed because teachers didn't want their students going on YouTube and getting exposed to all the all the stuff that they shouldn't see. So they created a for school version, and and you know that's clean and that's going to be able to give you a place to find videos as well as for you to create and place your own videos. And Vimeo is again um, uh, another one of those sites. So. CK12, I mean, in general, there are very, you, you get very few percent of users that create content. We are actually very fortunate that 25% of our content is user generated. We have 40,000 flexbooks. We have 17,000 concepts. We have, and these are just samples I'm giving you, 9,000 flashcards and, and study guides and you know other stuff that you could actually get that others have been using in the classroom. Now, we don't necessarily expose all this. We quality assure and make sure that everything that you get is uh, the right, um, good quality thing. Here's a user that um, in Korea took our content and completely did his whole, whole class work on, on this website. He's not unusual. There are other people that are doing this kind of work on our website. But I just wanted to share with you, I couldn't do the whole page because it was too long, I couldn't. But you, you, know, you should go check it out on our website. So technology gives us the tools to reimagine education. It doesn't do it, it doesn't do learning for us. It cannot substitute you know, what we as teachers or mentors have to do to help our students learn. It's something that we, the, the technology is just a tool that we have to be able to, uh, it makes our life easier. It will take our zombie students and bring them back. Okay, cute, but you know. <laughs> um, so why has it changed? Why are things changing? When you go back, remember the timeline? The timeline 
if you looked at each one of those components, was a single function box. Now we've got technology that's actually advanced a lot. Um, I met uh, this gentleman on the plane and who was telling me that in the 70s, a professor tried at Stanford to change the genetics department and teach them computer science so they could get better tools. Guess what? He could not change their mindset because their mindset was about biology and how uh, things work in biology. They couldn't marry the computer, uh, computer um, uh, what's possible with computers. I remember when I was doing my master's in uh, molecular biology, every time I had to park that damn P PC before shutting it off, I'd get into trouble. I remember using um, um, electron microscope. I was learning at that time electron micros microscopes had just come up. I, it was very frustrating for me to get that gel set right, this, the thickness it had to be, with the sample in the right plane, because every time I made slices of those, and if the sample wasn't set right, I wouldn't get, a, uh, wouldn't get the right image. And imagine if I had said, technology, technology is zombie. It doesn't work. I would have never seen the wonder of seeing a cell with a nucleus and a plasmic Golgi, you know, uh, endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi's and all the other stuff that you see in a cell. I would have never seen that. I would have never progressed. What has changed is that now we can actually not only provide you more than that box, we can actually provide, provide you customizable content customization pro content, so you can do it for your own content. Texas can do it for their own students. They don't have to be part of the common course. California can do it for their students. The, uh, the uh, charter schools can do it for themselves. The context is very important. We can now teach students how to go through and learn in ways that they don't have to keep wondering, why do I have to learn what I have to learn? And again, Computers are becoming more and more accessible because they are cheaper. We can afford to do that, and there's a lot of commitment that's coming out of the, the, the nation to do this. Um, I think, do I have time to? Um, this is a great quote by Neil Postman. Technological change is not additive. It's ecological, which means it changes everything. And really, if that's, we want to go from, if he had stayed at the slate and not gone to paper and pencil and not gone to, you know, the new media that's available today, I don't know where we would have been. So we can stay there or we can change everything. I'm going to take a couple of minutes just to kind of show you how it's done. And I hope technology works. Um, so this is a so this is our hold on come on I'm sorry the connection is really slow so if i these are all the subjects for which we have content on our website. It keeps wanting to go back. Okay, so let's go to geometry. Um, So we can go to any concept we might need. And oh, shit, 
sorry. So what we can do in here is we can go. Uh, sorry, I, this this is really slow. I'm sorry. Let me go into another one. I thought they would have better connection in South by Southwest. <laughs> okay. So this is actually one of the um, concepts that we provided. We provide, there are about 12 different modalities in this. And it starts with, on the left where you see read, that's your text format. Next, we provide videos. And we provide, um, there are three or four videos on this one. We have flashcards, study guides, which were created by students themselves. And then uh, we have real world um, uh, applications. We have inter interactive exercises so that you students can actually take quizzes. You want to go into one of those? Oh, no. Actually, I wanted to go to the quiz part. Sorry. Go back. Oh, OK. So this is part of. Um, where you actually put in answers and you know students are interacting with this stuff. Actually, maybe now we can also show them the, if, the, if it's working. Can we go back to, um, go back down, this one, this interactive, ex no, go down, uh, assessment, yeah, exercise, that one, yeah. So this is part of the assessment, so you can actually practice what you're learning. Um, and you can, teachers can also actually, we give you a tool. Yeah, just show them. I'm sorry, it's really slow. So if you get an answer wrong, um, we can give you a hint if you're, in, you know, if you're practicing or you can, it gets recorded what you're not doing well. And, and we have, you know, tools. You can contribute. You can create your own work sh sheets or workbooks, which acts like your uh, quizzes. So teachers are creating or their homework. So we provided a lot of these tools for teachers to um, be able to. Can we go back and show them the um, interactive ILO stuff? Yeah. No. In the PowerPoint. Oh, okay. We close it. So anyways, if he gets it, yeah, this is the one. You just play it. Play mode. Yeah, now you can, yeah. So uh, these are some of the interactive stuff that we've, you know, manipulatives that we're creating for students to learn from. You can open this. So here they can, you know, uh, change the parameters. And, and figure out how angular, simple harmonic motion affects. Um, so each one of these things become something that they're actually internalizing and looking and seeing how things work. If I change the length of this, um, um, and how will it Im impact the motion, the simple harmonic motion? Um, and of course, you know, the guitar is the uh, most form famous simple ha harmonic motion example. You can actually also, you know, if you don't, you, you, students can learn and see visually, so it's not quite, they're not quite disturbed. Um, I think technology is really important. It's actually really sad for us, would be really sad for us to throw it out with the bath water. Because there's so much potential. 
And there's so much commitment to technology and its use. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Hmm? Oh, yeah, sorry, Paul. <laughs> Okay, so we have uh, a little poll that we like to do. So I don't know how many of uh, you got convinced with this presentation, but we'd love to see which, uh, this is all free, so we'd like to see which of these zombie ideas you wanna see go first fixed time and variable learning. Traditional publishers create the best content and the highest quality educational resources need to be expensive. So these are your three choices. Help us decide which one is the most important uh, from your perspective. So, oh, I didn't show up. Um, So you can see where, where technology goes wrong. It's the humans that don't know how to use it. <laughs> so there's a text code, 37607, and it's all free. Please take out you know, your phones, and I'd love to see, um, love to get some input from you. And so just put the A, B, C code. A is uh, 37607, 666632 or B666633 with the 37607 in there. Um, so when you're done, just let me know you've done, if you're doing it. How many people are, are going to be putting it? Yeah. Hmm? Don't worry about it. Just leave it. Yeah. Okay, so I'll give you two more seconds. Are you all done? Or oh, you might want to see that in case. OK. Let's see the results. That was the slide. It works. So 45% thinks we need to change the system. Well, let's see if we can do it. Any questions or thoughts or? Um, yes. Go ahead. <laughs> all right, all right. They want me to use the microphone. I'll use the microphone. Um, I was going to kind of see if many of the more educational people were going to speak first, but I'll ask a more geeky question. I'm involved in kind of taxonomies, controlled vocabularies in, in general uh, in the library science world, so I have an interest in your concept maps. Who creates them? How do you create them? How do you maintain them? What are sort of the general standards and parameters around them? I'm glad you asked. Um, First of all, let me actually tell you that the content we create is created by teachers. That we actually have a process that we select them why it's, you know, it's, it's not just, we contract it out to teachers and they create this content. As far as the, the concept map goes, we actually took all the standards requirements from the 50 states and the common cores and some of the international thing and came up with what was the common theme, what was a common concept that was needed. So it isn't something that we just came up with. We actually created it out of a rigorous process. So all our content, which I didn't say, is actually standards aligned and common cores are aligned. So uh, as far as you know, where it is, it is where the education system is at today. At some is that concept map exposed somewhere on your Oh, it's all, site? It's, yes it is. Yeah, so, so Do you want to just show them? Yes, it's, it's on our site. We'll show you where it is. Okay, yeah. And I'm sorry about the, um, you know, the connection stuff, but. Um. 
Well, I'm actually from Austin, and I'll tell you, sometimes things are a little slow here. <laughs> sure. Thanks for your... Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, could you say something about your business model, uh, funding, uh, costs, uh, income? An Sure, that's another good question. Um, um, so, it is funded by my family funds. And so everything you see here is free. Um, and we have a long-term commitment to it. We have spent a lot of money on it, as you can tell, and will continue to do so. Does that? Makes sense. It's a philanthropic thought. Well, Niru, I was wondering, what's the fourth zombie out of your list of what's up next? <laughs> um, good question. I haven't thought about the fourth zombie. Actually, the fourth zombie is the mindset. That is really the biggest problem. If we can get ourselves out of that mindset, the way things are, that's the fourth zombie we have to kind of blow up. And w once we're in a much more, you know, uh, w this is not a put down on teachers, really. I think what happens if you're so not close to technology, it's really hard to figure it out, to kind of say, you know, um, my daughter, 25 years old, is sick. So she's texting me, Mom. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so that is, a, you know, so t teachers don't have the time. They're so caught up in what they have to do, which is unfortunate because you only make advances once you make commitment, once you make, take the time to do something, right? And we haven't gotten to that point yet with all the teachers, but I think it's getting there. When you look at the millions of usage stats I've been, I, I showed you, um, but I think part of that is also because the tools and the content aren't really married for teachers to make it worth their while. They have to go find something from one place and find something from another place. We are committed to making a complete system so that you're not going to have to find a place to go run around, do this, and run around, do that. It's everything is there for you in context. So I think that's the context that will make a, a difference once we change our mindsets. Um, my name is Mohsen. I'm uh, the founders of Top Hat Monocle. Um, first of all, it's a, uh, it's a great presentation. Uh, Thank I really you. enjoyed it you, very even, much. Even with all that glitch of stuff? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I paid uh, him 20 bucks, guys. A <laughs> um, question I had was, um, I guess, how many, can you talk a little bit about how many people actually beyond this presentation and, and, and the whole content, and you, you talk a little bit about 25% of your content is user generated, so there's 75% that you know, you, your, your team or your family uh, put money. I'd like to know how many uh, people are beyond that. And, and the I, second, I'm sorry, it's not clear, the question isn't clear. Sorry, how many, like how many team of developers, I guess, are developing these contents uh, okay. or maintaining the whole uh, websites and, you know, okay. that's, you I, know I like okay. to know that. And, and the second question I have is that you, you said that the whole money comes and back to the question of the business model. Um, so you're not getting any other uh, public funding? Is it no. truly, um, and if that's the case, what would you think that it's gonna run in the long term? Would you not think that, you know, eventually you know, you're gonna run out of money and you eventually need to, uh, you know, figure out the, a more sustainable business model and what are your thoughts on that? No, I think that's a very valid question. Um, I, and, you know, to be really honest with you, I don't have an answer for that. But long term, we are starting, and, and the reason I don't have an answer for is not because I'm not committed to long term or I don't know what to do. I think we're trying to see where it goes, right? In the long term, if we start putting in, you know, so much money that, and, and, and nobody uses it. It becomes pointless for us. So what I'd like, you know, what we're trying to figure out, this is an experimentation, and uh, experiment, and experiments have to be done. So we haven't come to the end of the experiment. Having said that, um, we are actually 
um, our license is Creative Commons, share alike, non-commercial. And the reason I put non-commercial in there is that if people want to commercialize that, tomorrow morning I think Amplify has a presentation. Amplify actually leased our content. And you know we are getting funding funds that are coming in through that model. Um, and that's a very standard business model where you kind of you know offer your goods for payback. Now, that's one model that we are uh, kind of uh, exploring. Have you thought about um, um, uh, you know the the part that I love the most? I guess was the uh, the user generated content, okay. and you said that there's 25 percent of that. Um, and if you could, uh, to my opinion, I guess that would be the best avenue to, to work on is that if you increase that 25% uh, to become eventually 100% by finding creative ways of giving people incentive that they could contribute, um, whether it could be a you know, model of, you know, like teachers pay teachers model or you know, even, even people can you know, make some a few bucks out of those and making it self-sustained by, by users, I, that might be a good idea. I don't know if that's, you have thought about no, that. No, definitely. I think, you know, uh, thank, thank you for the suggestion. Um, th these, these are kind of things, you know, when I started, people said, show me your, you know, your business plan. They, everyone wanted me to hand out business plans. And I said, I don't have one. All I have is an idea that I want to go and uh, figure out would it work? How, where would it take us? And so we're in a place where we actually keep taking one step at a time. And I think we can, we can uh, sustain this in ways we haven't even imagined. And I think user generation is a huge issue that we're actually now trying to tackle. We didn't have the development side done of it. We are about 30 people altogether full time. And we have over hundreds of teachers who are contracted to help create this thing. So, um, you know, we're doing both content and tools. So it, 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 it's, it's, I love the journey. I love doing this because then we are creating something useful. So yes, definitely it's going to be around if you want to use it. If people, teachers don't want to use it, you know, I'm going to go to vacation. Can you please tell us, can you please tell us about the, um, something about the demographics of who uses the site and, and schools uh, that have adopted it? So, um, yes and no. I can tell you the demographics over the last year and a half. We've had um, charter schools use it. We've had pro pro public schools using it. We have states using it. Um, and and it's, it's just the beginning. We have students using it. We have some amount of information that he can pull over, pull up, but I don't pay too much attention to that right now. Uh, uh, the idea is to be able to give you a choice. It doesn't matter who you are. This is why the concept-based learning becomes, you know, kind of uh, cleans the way for everyone to use it in ways they want to use it. So here are some school districts. If you go on our About page, um, Um, so you can, you know, there's the Utah, Utah did a great project around, uh, I, I don't know whether I mentioned it in my talk, but, you know, they've been using it and there's, there's a lot of testimony, uh, pilots that are going on that have, uh, we've kind of put up. Thank you for the presentation. Have you made your content available outside of the English language? Ourselves, no. We did a pilot in, 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 in India, a small pilot, which we did do some conversion. But like I said, it's really hard for us to do it. So every, anyone who wants to help us do that, please come forward. We'd love that help. Hello. Hi. Have you um, come up with any creative solutions to dealing with copyright issues what, for user-generated content? <laughs> or have you had to? <laughs> No, we haven't had to so far, but that's, a, that's every open resource provider's nightmare, right? But I, you know, the solution is very simple. It's not our intent to take IP content. 
it's our intent that if we know that somebody's put IP content to take it down immediately. So some of that has to come from you. You have to meet us halfway when you see, hey, this is my IP. This is our content. We'll take it down. It's not our intent. That's the only way to do it at this point. Thank you. I guess as a follow-up, though, yes. <laughs> what happens when you have lots of other people using that content and now you have to take it down and it disrupts? Um, that's reality, right? That's part of the game. It was not our intent that somebody put IP content. <laughs> yes, I, I just wanted to ask you to elaborate on the uh, real world competition. Sure. Uh, that sounded really interesting. I'd like to see what happened. I mean, yes. what, I would just like a little more information. Sure, absolutely. So the real world competition is for students. What I believe in, if, if you remember that video I showed, um, you know, and, and I would, I'd love to hear from some of you what stayed in your mind after the presentation, not how boring I was or how bad I was, but out of the presentation, what were two or three things that stayed with you? And so um, here, here's the, you know, the, the, uh, the idea about get real competition is I want to start getting students really excited about learning. And this is a small, our small effort to do that, which says that if you take any concept that you're learning in middle school and high school and create real good examples, being very um, conscious and rigorous and you know, presentation counts, creativity counts, critical thinking counts, real examples around that concept, and give, send them to us. We are committed to um, giving your whole class up to 25 devices, iPads, Kindles, whatever you might choose. Um, but you have to take part, and it's the last day is 11, uh, April 15th. For all the educators in the room, I would really love for you to go out and spread the power, you know, word. Second prize is 10, 10 devices. So it's, it's, I think it's our little ways of getting these things into classrooms. Yes, do you, a question in the back. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Do you plan to be a source for the learning registry and are you using the learning registry schema for did indexing? Anish, did Anish pay you to say that? No. Uh, no. <laughs> no, actually when learning registry started, we were one of the first ones to give them, uh, because we had already done this work, we actually talked to them and gave them the background of what we had done. We actually took some of our content and meta tagged it for them, okay, for the learning management the registry and the LMRI stuff. So yes, we are, but you know what? It's really hard for me, most people to tag everything after the fact. So, are you using the uh, learning registry? I have a uh, software company that uh, has a data management platform. We have several statewide contracts and we're being asked to link to the learning object repository and make sure that we're able to make use of the metadata tagging. So we'd be very interested to find out also as a follow-up question, uh, have you worked with proprietary software vendors or companies that are for profit but need access to the content through their platforms? Yes, we have. Yes, we have. And, and you know, my, t my, uh, my teammates are sitting in the front row, so please get in, you know, um, in touch with them if you have more specific questions. Um, yes, sorry. So it sounds like a lot of your focus has been on developing content and some really great uh, tools for people to use. What are you doing to encourage adoption? Is that a focus right now? And what do you think are some of the challenges in adopting this platform and this idea wider? So in, in terms of adoption, do you mean individual adoption? Do you mean schools or states? I mean schools or states. That's a really hard process for schools and states. Schools actually are easier. And this is why we started with high school content, because you have a lot more you know, freedom to do, do what you, you know, to, to do what you have to do with high school student versus K-5, which is very, very regulated, right? So when we started with the uh, high school, the idea was this uh, adoption, open adoption. Um, 
I guess when we started, a lot of the states, because of financial situations, just shut down the process of adoption. Now we are getting adoptions uh, in small in states that are actually being proactive. California with the initiative, uh, Washington State. Um, I'm hoping Kentucky and you know some of the other states that are now starting to uh, realize that they have to start paying attention to these open resources that are actually pretty good quality and managed well. So that process has been a nightmare. Um, so we've actually t taken a both grassroots approach and the top-down approach um, really hard, but we are doing it. Do you have any suggestions for us? Mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming and listening to me.